There, Leviticus 23. All right. I'm just going to read the first two verses. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, or feasts, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. So that's part of the law that was given to the Israelites. And, and you can kind of check. We're going to be going through those, each, of those, um, each of those feasts or festivals uh, this morning. You know, here, here in the West, in the 21st century, we, we celebrate. We have our own American holidays. Some of these are celebrated worldwide, like, like Christmas and, and Easter. And especially those two, they obviously point to Jesus, right? Uh, the birth of Jesus and the um, Good Friday, the death of Jesus, and Easter is the, the resurrection of, of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And um, actually, some of those holidays, uh, those two even, uh, you may not know, they also have a pagan uh, background as well. But historically, uh, Christians have not back, uh, shied away from that. Christians, the church has taken advantage of the opportunity to show Jesus even when uh, paganism and these other traditions got in the way, like the Christmas tree has a pagan origin, but Christians used it to show that Jesus is the light of the world. So they always used it as an opportunity. I think that's good theology and good doctrine, too, that we are placed here to renew things, to reconcile it back to God, to bring it back to God, right? And so even Halloween, a lot of people don't realize it also has a Christian origin because they didn't shy away from it. The Christians used it because November 1st is All Saints Day. And so uh, Halloween became known as, as All Hallowed's Eve. So they took advantage to show Jesus Christ in those holidays. Well, Israel also had holidays, and they were required to keep these holidays because it was a part of the law that we've been that we've been going over and, and learning about. And unlike these other uh, holidays where they've been maybe turned on their, on their head, you know, except for Easter, that does fall uh, uh, according, you'll see, with some of these Jewish holidays. But um, Christmas has been turned on its head and what we spoke about with Halloween. These holidays were instituted by God, and they, they had a purpose. And ultimately... And uh, speaking of strengthening your, faith, strengthening your faith, Joey was talking about this morning, that's the goal this morning, that as we go through these feasts that God instituted through Moses, you'll see its purpose, and its purpose was all to point towards the Messiah, to point towards Jesus. So I hope as we see this, these aha lights go off in our heads, and we're encouraged, and we're strengthened, we're like, wow, God is awesome, and he's been working this whole plan out. And if he's worked all this plan out in Jesus, man, he's got my life in his hands as well. So to recap, you know, in our story, uh, sinful Israel, a holy God, and in order for um, a holy God, a God who's set apart and perfect and without sin, to have a relationship with these people that he wants to have a relationship with, he has to give them this uh, intricate law. And we've been going over the different aspects of, of the law. Um, uh, there's the civil law, that God gave, and just like we have a law in our nation that we obey, we're a democracy, Israel was a theocracy. And what that means is that like their law was directly given by God through Moses. But it was for that nation to obey, all right? And this whole law, what we've seen is that Jesus, he is the fulfillment of all of this law. He fulfilled it all. He said, I've come to fulfill the law. That's what he was here for. And so he fulfilled the civil, the civil law because he himself was an Israelite. He was from the nation of Israel, and he obeyed that law perfectly. Another aspect of the law we saw was the moral law. And a lot of those, you find, you find a lot of those in the Ten Commandments. And uh, this moral law, even though it was given to Israel, it's an eternal law that has always existed. So uh, just because we're not a part of Israel and just because Jesus has come, the, the, the moral aspect of God's law, which reveals his character, we still obey because it's how we love God and we love our neighbor. And the New Testament talks about that time and time again. So that's why we don't steal. That's why we don't uh, commit adultery. That's why uh, we uh, love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we don't put other things above him. That's because that's part of God's character and who he is, even though the law of Moses doesn't apply to us. Make sense? 
Then there's the ceremonial law, okay? And there's two parts to this. So last week, we went through the, the tabernacle, and hopefully I put it in a simple enough fashion that we could see Jesus, even if we don't remember every aspect of it. I encourage you, if you haven't watched that sermon, go back and, and watch it. That God, because God wanted to dwell with his people, but they were full of sin, he uh, instituted this sacrificial system, and they, uh, they had to build this tabernacle according to his word and his plan that he could come and dwell uh, in the midst of the people. And so there was this whole sacrificial system where they would make atonement for sin so they could have a relationship with God. Go back and, and watch um, that sermon if you haven't again. And then the, the second part of the ceremonial law is what we're going to talk about this morning, and that's these, these feasts. These, uh, these festivals that were a part of the law of Israel, and they had, to, to, uh, they had to keep these laws. So I hope it strengthens your faith this morning. So let's, let's just dive right in. Now, the first one you see there in Leviticus chapter 23, if you have your headers, you know, if you have your headers in your Bible, is the, uh, the Sabbath. You can go ahead and go to that next slide, Edu. The Sabbath, it's debatable whether that's an official... Uh, most people consider it seven feasts, which are all the feasts after the Sabbath, this, because these, these other uh, feasts, festivals, they, they took place once a year. The Sabbath was a, weekly, was a weekly, uh, weekly affair, but it takes precedence over the rest. And God was saying that my Sabbath, no matter if you're, in a, if you're taking part in a feast or whatever, when my Sabbath comes, which is that seventh day, the Saturday, uh, you need to rest. Just like I rested when I created the world, you need to take time and you need to rest on that seventh day. But even Jesus fulfills the Sabbath. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 4 says that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We find our rest in him. And so we strive for that rest, the rest of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus himself says in Matthew 11, he says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So now we get to these seven feasts that we're focusing on, and they're divided. Uh, there's, there was um, four feasts in the spring time, and then there were three feasts, then there was a break into the fall, and then there was these three feasts uh, in the fall. So uh, the first spring feast, and they're all lumped together, is the Passover. Now, those of you who have been a part of this church for any length of time, we talk about the Passover often. Uh, when we take the Lord's Supper, communion, which we're going to take at the end of the service, just this one time this week, we usually do it during worship, um, uh, we, we discuss the Passover because there's a direct correlation between what we do when we take communion and the Passover. So the Passover uh, fell on the 14th day of the first month. The 14th day of the first month. Uh, in, in, in our uh, Western Gregor Gregorian calendar, that falls in March or April time, all right? So what the Passover did is it commemorated when Israel was in bondage to, uh, to Egypt. They were slaves for 400 years, and then God sent Moses to deliver them from Egypt. And he did this through these 10 plagues. He sent these 10 plagues on Israel so that he would force the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, to, uh, to release Israel and let them go out and worship uh, their God. So he did these 10 plagues. And on the 10th plague, God says, I'm going to send an angel of death. I'm going to send death throughout the land. And so Israel, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a lamb uh, from your flock, all right? A perfect lamb that's not, that's not lame, that's healthy, you know, without blemish. And I want you to take it and I want you to slaughter that lamb. And I want you to take the blood of that lamb and I want you to put it over the doorpost of your house. Because when death comes through, I'm going to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. But when death sees the blood of the lamb over your doorpost, it will pass you over. Hence the name, the Passover, that, that first feast. And so that's what they did. And uh, they would slaughter the lamb, put the blood over their doorpost. And they were to take that lamb and they were to consume it. They were to eat it as a family with unleavened bread, without yeast, this unleavened bread. And the reason for that was because, um, as we'll see with the next part of this feast, the next feast, 
is that Israel had to get the heck out of Dodge. They had to leave so quickly that they weren't able to leaven their bread. So it was these flat cakes, you know. Uh, that's, our bread over here is, is, uh, is flat. It doesn't have any, uh, any yeast in it. So, uh, and then they ate these bitter herbs, and there was this whole ceremony, and that bitterness of those herbs uh, represented that harsh time. So in, 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 as they did this generation after generation, when they ate those bitter herbs, they would remember that harsh time when they were in the land of Egypt. So the cool thing is, is that when Jesus came, uh, John the Baptist refers to him as the very Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he came to give us a different type of deliverance, to deliver us from our sins. And the, the interesting thing that we see in the Gospels and, and in history is that God intentionally aligned the events of Jesus with these feasts. Jesus died on the Passover. He died during this Passover time. Why? Because he's the true. He's the fulfillment of it. He is the Lamb of God. And so during the Passover meal, he was celebrating that meal that they were to celebrate, and he was there with his disciples, with his followers. And during this Passover meal, he presented to them that he was the Lamb of God, that this represented him. And he told them to eat of his flesh and to drink of his, his blood. In fact, uh, early... Um, early on, the early parts of the church, a lot of outsiders thought that the Christians were cannibals because they had heard about these Christians eating of their Messiah's of flesh and drinking of his blood, and they thought that they were, they were cannibals because of this. But that's what it represented was, was Jesus. And when we receive Jesus, when we place our faith in Jesus, he placed the blood of the Lamb over the doorposts of our heart, and death passes us over. So though we die in this life, we will be resurrected once again to eternal life with our Lord and Savior. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Um, so the second day, now Passover was a, a week-long thing. From Nisan, that was the name of, of uh, the Jewish month, Nisan 14 uh, 14th of Nisan to the 21st, all right? Now, on the second day of Nisan, and that also went to the 21st, so on the 15th, also in March and April, so Passover would begin, but it would go on. Well, then the next day began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, because I said that Israel had to leave Egypt so fast that they couldn't uh, leaven uh, their bread. So for this whole week, Israel had to eat. They still celebrate this today. They, they, they could only eat unleavened bread. They couldn't have any... Um, leaven in their bread. And so that was to remember Israel's flight from Egypt that was in haste. But then the leaven also represented sin. It represents sin. So uh, the unleavened bread was to be without sin. So what the father of each home uh, had to do is he would go on uh, the day before and he would sweep the house clean, get all of the leaven out of the bread. And he had to do this meticulously. He had to take a little... Uh, uh, little utensil, a feather, and, and get out all the breadcrumbs in the house. And he would put it in a bag, and he would take it outside and burn it because there could be no leaven in the house. It represented sin. Jesus says, John 16, uh, 6, 35, rather, he says, I am the bread of life. He says that he's our, he's our sustenance, that we, that we feed on him. He told the disciples at the Passover meal, he said, this is my body which is given to you, do this in remembrance of me. Now, the interesting thing is, as we partake in this matzah, this unleavened bread, uh, you'll notice that it's bruised or striped, and it's also pierced. That's the way that it's uh, made, representing the, the piercing of Jesus Christ, and by his stripes we are healed. And during this Jewish Seder meal, there's a portion uh, for the kids where there would be three pieces of this matzah, right? And the second, the second piece of this matzah, so Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, all right? The, the second piece of this matzah would, would be broken, all right? And then you would take the, the, the one, one piece of that and it would be wrapped in a cloth, right, or a napkin, and then it would be hidden away. And at the end of the meal, the children would go and hunt and find this, uh, this piece of bread and receive, receive a prize. So it was Jesus. He's, he's our bread. He was broken on our, on our behalf. He was wrapped up. He was buried. 
and he resurrected on the third day. Isn't that cool, or am I too nerdy? So that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It started that second day of, of Passover. The Passover, all this is clumped together here. The third day is called the Feast of First Fruits, or Rishit. Nisan 16, March or April, again, that third day after Passover, or when the Passover begins. Now, this was a first fruits of the harvest. So uh, they would take uh, the barley would, uh, would grow first. So what they would do, uh, the wheat would be later um, in the year. So they would take their first fruits, their first crop of, of barley, and they would dedicate it to the Lord as an act of, uh, of, ded- of dedicating this harvest as an offering. For the, just like when we give our offering, you know, we're thanking God for what he's given us. And so they would, they would take a, bun- a sheaf they would, and they would mark it. Um, they would bundle it up and they would leave it standing in the, in the field. And so the next day, they would cut it down and they would prepare it for an offering. And then on the third day, this, this uh, Feast of First Fruits, this Festival of First Fruits, they would wave it uh, before the Lord as an offering, as an, act of, as an act of worship on the third day. Jesus was resurrected on the third day after, after Passover. So he died, right? And then on that third day, on the day of First Fruits, that's what Israel would have been celebrating, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He's, he's our first fruits of a new harvest, of a new creation. God was doing something new in Jesus Christ. He, he created the earth, right? Full of sin and brokenness. And with Jesus, it's the beginning. It's the first fruits of something new, that new creation through Jesus Christ. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 20-23, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead. Listen to this. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means dead. The first fruits of, of those who had died. For as by a man came death, that's, that's uh, referring to Adam. Adam was the first to sin and brought death and sin into the world. By a man has come the resurrection of the dead. That is Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die because sin and death was passed along like a virus or like DNA to the rest of mankind, so also in Jesus Christ all shall be made alive. Verse 23, but each in its own order. This is important. Each in its own order. Christ, the first fruits. You see that? The first grain of the harvest, the barley that was set aside, that was the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. The fullness of the harvest. Us who believe in Jesus. He's the first fruits and then we are all gathered with him in its fullness. So from the first fruits, Israel would begin counting down the days until another feast. Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. And it was 50 days from this time. Or seven Sabbaths. Seven Saturdays they would count. And then would come the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. Uh, and that takes place in our calendar uh, around May or June. You see, we're on a solar calendar. Israel was on a lunar calendar. That's why it doesn't always match up. That's why it varies according to our calendar. So this was celebrating the fullness of the harvest, right? The Feast of First Fruits was that beginning. The barley was the first to rise up, okay? And then now... It's all coming in its fullness. The wheat has come up as well. So they would do another offering of first fruits of, of wheat before God. And that's what Pentecost was all about. It also had a two-part celebration. It also celebrated the giving of the law, which we're learning about now, on Mount Sinai to Israel. Because when, when Israel came out of, of, uh, of Egypt on the first Passover, it was 50 days later that they were at Mount Sinai and God gave the law to Moses for his people. So, 50 days after the resurrection, Jesus was resurrected, and uh, if you know your Gospels, he was on the earth for 40 days with his disciples, appearing to them at various times. And then he told them, I'm about to go to my Father in heaven. I'm about to go, I'm about to send into heaven where he is king, and I want you to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit that I'm about to give you. So, 40 days They waited for 10 days, and they were in an upper room, and they were praying, and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. Tongues of fire, it says, just like the fire that came down on Mount Sinai 
tongues of fire came and rested on them and they were filled with power and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. God was beginning to do something new through Jesus Christ in His new people. James 1.18, of God's own will, He brought us, think of us as the church, forth by the word of truth, that is the gospel, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. So you see, you've got Jesus, who was the first fruits when he raised from the dead, and we're the beginning of the first fruits, right, which will come to completion upon his return. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're marked as the first fruits. It's like the sheaf that is marked before God. Romans 8.23, we, the church, have the first fruits of the Spirit. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God chose you as the first fruits. See, When Israel, when this church, when this early church would have heard all this, especially the Jews, the Gentiles maybe needed more explanation, but these Jews would have been like, wow, this is awesome. I mean, because they've been doing this their whole life, and they've been doing this for generations, going all the way back to Moses, celebrating and and, and following this law, and now it's all coming together. So this language, you know, it has to be explained to us. But when he said first fruits, they knew exactly what he was talking about. I was like, wow, I see the correlation. I see how all this is coming together. That Jesus is that Passover lamb, and he rose on the third day on the day of first fruits. And now 50 days later on Pentecost, when everybody is gathered in Jerusalem celebrating, the fullness of the harvest comes in as the Holy Spirit comes and lands on his people, and God begins to do something. That's awesome. I don't know about you, but that's awesome to me. The old covenant, God gave the law. In the new covenant, he gives his Holy Spirit, which is much better than the law. Remember, we, I told you, you guys before, the law is good. It's the wisdom of God, right? I mean, especially that moral law, it's the wisdom of, of God. And even in that, 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 that civil law, it's good. It had a good purpose. But it gives us no power to obey it. It gives us not the ability to obey. Israel couldn't obey it. That's why as we go through the story, you're going to see, yeah, a lot of disobedience. But the Spirit, the Spirit, one, one, because it's it's, it's Jesus working through us, he's forgiven us of our sins, wiped them clean, no condemnation, right? But then it gives us power. It gives us power to live for him, his Spirit dwelling within us. It's good news. Romans 8, 2. Paul says, for the law of the spirit of life, listen to that word life, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Not that the law is bad, but the law is death because we can't obey it. We can't obey it. It brings no life. But the spirit of God who fulfilled the law, right? It's all in him now. Now we don't have to do it. Because he does it all. He fulfilled it all. He obeyed it all. He, he's the sacrificial lamb. All that stuff. Now as a free gift, when we receive Jesus, all of that that's, that the law is all embodied in, now through God's spirit comes and dwells in us. You see, you don't, you don't have to do anything. You just believe in Jesus. You just look to him. So stop trying so hard. Now we obey him, but we do it freely. We do it because we love Him, because He's our King and He's our Lord and He set us free. You see how it works? Because He's good and He knows what's best for us and He's wisdom and and Jesus is the embodiment. He's the character of God. He set us free. He set us free. Man, when when you keep trying to do it on your own, sin and death, that's all you can expect. And all you'll expect in the end is judgment and God doesn't want that for you. He's he's provided this. (laughs) He went through all of this, all of this stuff. This intricacies in the Old Testament. All of this to point to Jesus, to bring his son, the word become flesh, so that you could receive it. That's the spring festivals. Passover, we celebrate Easter in there. Good Friday, the beginning of the the Passover. Yeah, Jesus died, right? Two days later, or three days later, the third day, you start the first on the Passover. That's how that third day works, in case you didn't know. You You start on that Friday. That's the first day, the second day. The third day of Sunday, because if we count like we like to count, we're like, well, that's the second day, you know, Saturday, Sunday, but it starts, you count each day. So he rose again on the, the, third, the third day, which we celebrate as, as Easter, and then 50 days later, which we don't celebrate enough, is Pentecost. And so this transition, many believe, some people, 
uh, in the church believe that this, this break from the spring to the fall represents the church age right now. It, it, it represents that time between uh, these events and the second coming of Christ and the new heavens and the new earth, the promised land. Because Israel was going through a break, right? They received all this. Remember at Mount Sinai, the law? Now for 40 years, they're going to wander in the desert before they cross over into the promised land. That all foreshadows us, where we're at now, that wilderness that they're about to be in. That's, that's us right now. We're in the wilderness of this earth waiting, waiting to cross over into the promised land. So some people believe that God intentionally has a break here as we go to the fall feast. So here's the fall feast. The Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, uh, that takes place in September or October on our calendar. It's already, it's already happened. This is the beginning of the new year. Now, if you're clo paying uh, close attention at the beginning, I talked about uh, with Passover being the, the first month, but this says it's the new year. Yeah, I know it's confusing. It kind of confuses me, too. To, uh, Israel had two new years. They had one where they, begin, they began their month and another where they actually began the new calendar year. So it didn't, it didn't begin. It, it wasn't the same as like our Jan. It was like as if... We uh, turned to 2018 in, in, uh, in July or something, but January was still the first, the first month. I know it's confusing, but for our purposes, we, it, it's okay. So this was, the, this was their new year. This is the time they celebrated like we celebrate our new year, the Feast of Trumpets. So, but it was considered to be both a happy time and also a somber time. It was happy because it was a celebration of the new year. So you'd have a good time and celebrate and, and God's blessings. And, and, um, but it was also somber because this was a time that you, you would reflect, the, the people of Israel would reflect on the past year. And they would reflect on, uh, take a stock uh, over their life. And uh, have, they, have they lived for God? Have they sinned uh, against God? So repentance, this was a time of repentance. These were... We're uh, beginning here with the Feast of Trumpets, and all the way to the Day of Atonement, it was a time to, of repentance, of, of, of confession, and good deeds. They would, they would perform these good deeds during this time because uh, the Bible talks about a book of life, that God has a book of life, which everybody who's been appointed to eternal life is written in this book of life. He knows it all beforehand. He knows who, who, uh, who, who is going to belong to. To him, so um, they would take stock of their life, and they would try and perform these good deeds so that they could be on on God's uh, good side. And a common greeting during this day, whether in cards or what you might say to people, is "May you be inscribed and sealed for a good year." So, uh, uh, pronouncing blessing on one another that they would be uh, sealed in the book of life for another for another year. Revelation in the New Testament says that this book of life belongs to the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. It's called the Lamb's book of life. It's been given to Jesus. It belongs to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul says, For Christians, to examine yourselves, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or you, do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So even for us, in, in, um, in the church age, those of us who belong to Jesus through grace, we need to examine ourselves. It's good to examine ourselves. Now, it, through faith in Christ, we can't win brownie points with God. It's not like God, God's going to look, look at, you know, at your life and say, oh, wow, you did this. Okay, you're better than this person. You, you come on in. It doesn't work. It's only through Jesus. But God, remember, we live for him. It's good for us to take a stock for our, uh, of our lives. And there will be those who think they're of Christ. They've been religious their whole life, but they have never invited Jesus in. They have never made him Lord of their life. They've never surrendered to him. And so Paul encourages the church, examine yourselves to see if you're in Christ. Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Is he the one that you're looking to? And so during this Feast of Trumpets, the shofar or the ram's horn was blown 100 times during uh, the synagogue surfaces. And I've asked Edu to play a clip of this shofar, this ram's horn that was blown 100 times during these services.
Okay, that's an, let me go back here. So I wanted you to hear this because this, this, this trumpet, this ram's horn, was, was blown for a number of occasions. One, to announce a, a, a king's rule. When a new king was appointed over Israel, the ram's horn would be blown, blown that sound that you hear there. Uh, God's holy presence, we see that in the Bible. When, when God came and resided on Mount Sinai, the shofar was blown, uh, the, the trumpets, you could hear the trumpet sound as God's presence came down on the mountain as a battle cry for God's judgment because God used Israel to judge these horrible evil nations when they crossed over into the promised land. And it was a battle cry, this shofar that was blown that you heard. And it was also preparation for the Day of Atonement, which started 10 days before during this Feast of Trumpets. And so they would blow these horns all day, all right, in preparation for the Day of Atonement, which we'll talk about next. This shofar, this trumpet, will also be blown at the second coming of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we shall not all die, uh, stay in the grave, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. He's talking about the shofar. And the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So the shofar sounds at the judgment. So this, this, uh, this prepared Israel for the Day of Atonement, and it also foreshadowed a coming judgment. And they also looked to a coming judgment as well in Israel. So next, 10 days later, was the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. And... Uh, this happened yesterday. The Day of Atonement was, was yesterday, Yom, Yom Kippur. And it's the highest, it's the highest of all of the holy days. So there were 10 days of repentance, including that Feast of Trumpets, which kind of kicked it off with all the trumpets blowing in preparation. And this word atonement means reconciliation to God and reconciliation to mankind. And so what would happen here... Um, uh, Yom Kippur, it was that final day of this repentance when God would judge all of his people. So what would happen is uh, the high priest, he would take an animal and he would sacrifice it on his behalf, and then he would take an animal and he would sacrifice it on behalf of the nation of Israel, and he would take the blood. For those of you who were, who were here last week, he would enter into the tabernacle, and then only one time a year could he go into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, because that is where God resided, and if it wasn't him that went in there, and if he didn't make the right preparations and cleansing and ritual cleansings and, and so forth, he would die. No one else was allowed in there. So one time a year, this high priest could go in there with this blood for him and for the people and uh, sprinkle it over the mercy seat where God would reside. And so that was making atonement for their sins so that they could continue in this relationship with God. Then after he did that, there was another uh, animal called the scapegoat. And they would take uh, this goat and the high priest would lay his hands on the goat and he would ceremonially uh, transfer the sins of, of Israel onto this goat and then they would set the goat free in the wilderness and this this goat symbolically carried off their sins to never be seen again <clears throat> Jesus is our high priest we talked about that last week he is he, and we get to be his priests and that's the beautiful thing about it but but he is our high priest he is our sacrifice he is our scapegoat. He's everything in the tabernacle. He's everything. It's all, God is a genius, isn't he? I mean, how he did all this, and then he made it all come together in one man. And it's amazing that people think that, that somehow the disciples made this stuff up. Like, seriously? Have you read it? No. They, I mean, they don't understand. They haven't read it. They don't, and then there's a spirit, you know, we can get into all that at another time. But Jesus is the high priest. He's the sacrifice. He's the scapegoat. And when he died on that cross, as that sacrificial lamb, that veil was torn in two so that we can walk in directly to the presence of God. Like it literally, not figuratively, it literally was torn in two. And God was showing us, hey, you have direct access because my son is so good. <laughs> 
And he did all this for you. Come on in to the Holy of Holies. This mercy seat is open to all. It's good news. Only through Jesus. No other name. You see why there's not many bridges? God made us a bridge to cross over. We're like, why can't we do it this way or this way or this way? It's like, my goodness, I built a bridge. Who complains about going over a bridge when somebody, I mean, really, think about it. Do you complain when you see a bridge going over uh, a river or whatever? Are you looking for other ways to get over the river? No, you just cross the bridge. That's the bridge that God provided, his son, Jesus. He loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would trust in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Only through Jesus do we pass through judgment. And Hebrews 9.12 says that Jesus entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Hebrews 9.27.28 And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and then after that comes the judgment, Verse 28, so Jesus Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So he is coming again when that trumpet blows. We don't know the day or hour, those who are predicting this. Some people, because of the hurricane, and somehow we're focused on all this stuff that's happening right here in the Gulf of Mexico for some reason, and now it's the end of the world. You know, and it just so happens that uh, yesterday was the, the you know, the um, Day of uh, Atonement and the, the Feast of Trumpets has already passed. There are people, again, predicting it's, it's coming. No, we don't know the day or hour. Yeah, maybe it happens. Maybe it correlates because God ha- has a habit of doing that. Maybe, maybe it correlates when it does happen. But I don't, I don't predict those things. It's wise not to. It makes us look bad. Last feast, the Feast of Booths. All right, so the Day of Atonement was on the 10th of Tishri, and uh, the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles, was on the 15th through the 22nd. This is also still celebrated. The Feast of of Tents, Tabernacles, Booths, whatever uh, you want to call it. It's a week-long celebration where uh, the people of Israel would build these temporary tents. And they would live in them, and they would decorate it. They would have fun and, and, and decorate it with some of the fruits and stuff that God had, had provided in celebration of his, his provision. And so they decorate them, and they live in them all week. I mean, there, there's Jewish people just love this stuff, love celebrating this. And it's, it's remembering God's faithfulness and protection as he brought. Remember Israel, they're mobile right now. They don't have their own land until they get to the promised land in our story, right? They're going through the wilderness, all right, in temporary tents. And so that's what they do in remembering. All this stuff is remembering stuff, and it's also pointing to something. It also looked forward to Israel to a new time when God would dwell with mankind, when God would dwell with them in a new way, not in a tabernacle, but he would dwell with them like he dwelt with Adam and Eve. And so in the temple, the temple doesn't stand anymore, but when the temple was standing, there was these golden menorahs, these golden lampstands, just like there's one in the temple. And last week we talked about that, that golden stand uh, represented the light of Jesus Christ. That would be, they would have those things in the temple courts. And at night, uh, the priests would light torches and they would do all these dances and stuff. And the history books tell us, the Jewish historians say, you've never seen a more beautiful sight than watching this, this festivities going on, these festival of lights happening uh, during this, this, uh, this time at the temple. It was during uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, that Jesus, he, in the Bible, we see that he, in John chapter 8, he goes to Jerusalem and he's partaking in this. And it's, in, it's during this festival. So imagine that scene in the background, those menorahs uh, that, are, that are lighting up the temple. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. And then we see at the first and second comings of Jesus Christ that God tabernacles with man first. John 1.14, the word, Jesus became flesh and dwelt. That word means tabernacled. He came and he made his tent among us. And then in Revelation 21, 1 through 4, it says, And then John looked and he saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he dwelt with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Hmm. You ready for that day? You ready for that day? Is it well with your soul? <laughs> I'm not talking about your circumstances. Are you, are you right with Jesus? Do you have peace with Jesus? Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. These feasts, they all point to him and he's coming again do you know the light of the world will you stand in the judgment have you been forgiven and set free let's take the time as we prepare to commune with with Jesus through uh, the Lord's Supper, let's take the time and reflect and repent and receive the life that Jesus has to offer. Can we take a, a moment of silence and, and bow our heads and, and do whatever it is, however you need to speak to God. Let's take a time of worship.